The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to The Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I am Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. The Honeydew Podcast.com is the website for the show. Please make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. We drop audio on Mondays. You got video on Tuesdays. All right. If you if you gotta have more do, join the Patreon community. That place it's wait till you hear some of the fucking stories that are coming out of this goddamn (laughs) thing. I am telling you, the shit we're hearing is unbelievable. It's five bucks a month. That's the only level there is. And if you sign up for a year, you'll save on over a month of free episodes. All right. Uh, You know I record here at the Santa Monica Music Center, so if you need music lessons, you need musical instruments, this is the spot. If you're looking for online classes, go to santamonicamusic.com slash, or excuse me, use the code HONEYDOO, and they'll waive the registration fee and give you a free lesson when you sign up for a package, all right? Uh, If you're new to the show, what we do over here is we highlight the lowlights. I always say these are the stories behind the storytellers. Today's storyteller here for the first time. Very excited to have him. Please welcome Steve Byrne. Oh, I'll clap for myself. You should clap for yourself. Yeah. Thank you, buddy. Thanks Thank for having me, man. Listen, I know we've been trying to make this happen. Yeah. There's a pandemic my going fault. on. We made it happen. Thank you for being here. You got it. It's long overdue, yeah. even though I'm looking at the black and gold Well, I picked here. this out of my suitcase today. I, I was like, I, I got to wear this then. <laughs> the hat and the guy. Yeah. The hat hurts from 1979. For, I was six years old. That still hurts. It's, 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 they're, they're going nowhere. I know. They're going nowhere. But um, please, before we get going somewhere, plug everything, dude. Everything you want. Yeah, I'm not sure when. Well, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'll be at the I'll, I'll be at the Irvine Improv uh, February 13th. I know. Are that. you doing the drive-in shows? Is that uh, what that I'm is? I'm doing. Yeah, I'm doing a. I, I believe a drive-in show. Have I'm you doing, done like, that yet? I haven't done an, a, a drive-in? drive-in show yet. I've done some outdoor shows. Mm-hmm. I've been doing comedy clubs, but not an outdoor show yet. So I'm a little trepidatious on how that'll go. Have you done it? No, I've done one show this entire fucking pandemic, and it's killing me. Oh, just one? One, bro. Oh, Jesus. Dude, I did, my first one was right at the height when um, (laughs) George Floyd, um, and they, you know, cops and- (laughs) So I'm saying you were out during all that shit? No way. Dude, the first, the first time I go on stage, this is like peak rioting, all that shit going down, and I'm in Miami, I'm on stage, I talk to- a black couple and I'm talking to them and I'm just like getting their perspective on things and getting the crowd worked up. And I literally, the next guy I talk to, I go, uh, he, he's like a buff guy in a medium t-shirt. And I go, so what do you do? He's like, I'm a cop. I'm like, oh, fuck, fuck. of all things. Yeah. You just feel the air leave the room. I just looked at the black people. I was like, I got this. And I walk <laughs> over and I start talking to him. And in the back of my head, I'm going, okay, well, I'm going to get these two to do a shot together. But I can't just hey, do it well, right now. Watch, watch the choice of words, bro. So I had to like, slow it Yeah, yeah. Be shot. <laughs> 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 you guys are gonna get shot together. What? <laughs> but I slowly started massaging the scenario, and there were literally uh, two ends. And towards the end of it, I got them to do a shot uh, All together right. with tequila, and it just set the tone for the rest of the show. The crowd started clapping. Everybody's in a great mood, and it was one of those things where it was like only through experience, I think, could I have. Thread the needle on that. I, I, you know, ten years in, twelve years in, fifteen years in, maybe I wouldn't have been able to pull that off. But, but uh, I posted it online, and Billy Gardell saw it, and he he walked me through. He walked me through the uh, the bit, and he goes, "Now pause it here. Now here's 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 the mark of a true pro." And he's telling me, and he, and, and I was watching. I was like, "Holy shit!" You could see me thinking these things, and it was really kind of cool to see another like seasoned vet walk you through one of yeah. your sets and say this is why i respect what you did that's, that's great. really kind of yeah. cool hell yeah which i've never had before happen in my life <laughs> that's awesome well yeah. what's the what, what's your website your social media your your oh, everything your, steve burn live your movie yeah the oh the film of. is called the opening act uh came out uh during pandemic just a few months ago it's 84 percent fresh on rotten tomatoes 87% fresh with audiences on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's uh, it's fucking great. It's fucking great. It's a real encapsulation of what it's like to really not only hit the road as a comic, but your first time ever on the road. Yeah. So you've been to a comic club, you've never been on the road, and that's what this film is about and what it takes to to take those first steps on that journey. That's great, dude. Yeah. Good for you to do that. It's cool. 
Now, I ask everybody to come with stories. You yep. brought a handful of stories, and I like jumping around like this, too. Okay. I like, I, I love the life stories, but I like jumping around. So the first one you said you wanted to start with was a, about a, how to involve the bar stool. Correct? Yeah, yeah. So I was, uh, and this goes into experience, right? And I was, I was new to the New York comedy scene, maybe two years in, and I was so... Is that where you started? Did you start in New York? Yeah, started in okay. New York. So the cellar was the first club I passed at, wow. which is crazy, like looking back on it. The second time I was ever on stage, I got a manager. So it was like out of the gates, I was I was like working at, at a, especially at like a, an elite level with like Geraldo and Colin Quinn and Jim Norton and all, and Patrice and, and, and Burr at, at the time. So it was like, I was really exposed to a lot of greats early on and so i was so hungry and like to me stand-up was always like a girl when you first start dating her like i couldn't stop thinking about it and so i go to the comic strip to work on a new bit which was probably dog shit and it was my birthday and it, i didn't want to go out and celebrate or drink i just want to go up and go up go up on stage so i go to the comic strip it's toward the end of the night and there's maybe like there's maybe 10 people in the audience and uh i go up and maybe two minutes in, this one table stands up and they start debating the bill. And they literally look like the cast of Jersey Shore. It was like, you know, it was that kind of audience. So I go, guys, could you just maybe take this outside? Uh, and and then they start calling me like, oh, okay, with Jackie Chan. Whoa. Oh, come on, man. And, and, and then they, they start saying these racial things to me. And I was like, well, thank God the Lincoln Tunnel's open 24 hours. You guys can get back to Hoboken or whatever the fuck, you know, like Parsippany or whatever I said. <laughs> There's and, only 10 people in there. They're like half of them. The other people over here loving it. <laughs> I, I, I didn't I have. that table like, get him, Jackie Chan. Get him, Jackie Chan. <laughs> I didn't have the experience, you know, to, to handle the situation. How Was it mostly guys or was it guys it was, it was dudes and then a girl. Okay. okay, and now big she's buff dude. She's pivotal to this to okay. this story. <laughs> Snooky, Snooky's pivotal. <laughs> she's very pivotal. <laughs> Snooky's very pivotal. So, so she, uh, so they're saying all this like kung fu shit and stuff, and I'm I'm, I'm just like fuck, and that, that 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 fuse was lit, right? So then this girl chimes and she's like, "Why don't you shut the fuck up and do your jokes?" And I was like, "Will somebody tell this cunt to shut the <laughs> fuck up?" And I dropped that C bomb. <laughs> Like, like Doctor Strange, love the, the bay doors open and it goes down. I'm riding the bomb, like, Woo! and I drop it. And next thing I know, this duel picks up. Uh, one of the guys picks up a par stool that was along the back wall where they're sitting. And this is like this isn't like some IKEA shit. This is yeah, yeah this, this is old this furniture that's been at this comic strip since the late early seventies. It's like yeah. hard steel forge. He takes it and chucks it. And it just like whoosh, whoosh. And I don't have the time to really like react. No. So I just like turn around and the thing cracks the back of my Whoa. head open. So all of a sudden it felt like someone was pouring hot water on my neck, just blood gushing. And I remember big Jay Okerson runs in. He goes, whoa, whoa. And he he starts pushing the guys back and holding them. And they call the cops and stuff. And I was like such a young dipshit. I'm like, I'm like, all right, well, give me the mic. I'm going to finish my set. And Jay's like, you're going to the hospital, dude. Did you go, I mean, were you down? You got up from that? No, it, it like just like hit you me. You got to be grabbing wall. your head and seeing blood on your hands. I, I saw a lot of blood, and but I, I, was, I didn't realize how bad it was until Heads Jay bleed, was like, though, they do, yeah. <laughs> he's like, you got to go to the hospital now. So I went to the hospital, and I'm getting eight staples in the back of my head. Damn, dude. So ch -ch 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 not stitches, like the tink, tink, tink. <laughs> And uh, no, when they oh, do it, it's like, <laughs> it really is like that. You, you know, did you ever have staples? Did you have, okay. I've had a couple right oh, here. You have, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like, it's like, <laughs> like your dad's putting some shit up yeah. in the garage. It's like, yeah. oh, that's real. Like you're literally stapling my fucking head. I thought it was like a medical term. Like, thank Rust clank, on that clank. gun, God damn, What are you doing back there? <laughs> oh my God, dude. That was so that, that early in comedy like that, huh? And I, I remember, mean, knock on wood, all these years I've yeah. been in, I've seen videos online. I've never... I, I, we saw, I was at a show one time. It was in Irvine. It was like me, Larson, Fulshron, somebody else. Oh, that's might a be, good crew to have Segura your back. Too. That's a good crew to have your yeah. back in case shit goes down. <laughs> I know. I'm, it's me against Jesus. four. I yeah, know. exactly. <laughs> um, 
but a lady rushed the stage on Jay. She charged. Oh. And it was just weird. It was it was like being at a zoo and all of a sudden that the door flew open. You know what I mean? You're like, huh? I know it's a lady, but Jesus Christ, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. She's running up the stairs and shit. <laughs> Jay's like, get this bitch. <laughs> I watched um I saw Bill Burr at Dangerfields. There was a there was a you know, there, there's he's been known to push some buttons. Yeah, a little bit. And there was a woman in her seventies. She was not fucking having it, okay? And so she goes, she says something to him. He's like, lady, they, 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 just jokes, they're just jokes. She goes, no, no, they're not jokes. And so she comes up, but she's walking. It's like in slow motion because she's so old. And Bird just, Bird didn't know what to do. So he took the mic stand and he held it. He goes, lady, you can't do this. You can't, you can't do this, lady. And I was like, that's so fucking that's funny. It's burning the hard drive. Hey, next yeah. time I'm going to take a chair. Like you a can't do this, lady. <laughs> I watched, um, well, you'll remember. Back in the day, three clubs. Remember that little spot, three clubs? Oh, yeah. It was a great little room, and Segura's in there one night, and I'm in there. They used to do, like, uh, Montreal callbacks mm-hmm. and shit. And I don't know what happened. I'm sure I'm going to tell it a little bit wrong, but there was a lady who was belligerent the whole time. And, right. And Tom finally called her a cunt. Right. Well, I, I think it was her sons or something were with her, and they were like, Oh, yeah. We're going to be stepping outside. So yeah. Tom, I'd never really seen him nervous, because he's a big dude. You know? Yeah. He's like, Hey, uh, you mind coming outside with me? Uh, <laughs> call that lady. A, I called that lady a cunt, and, and we had to go outside. He had to talk him down. Yeah, he had to talk him down. <laughs> I remember one night I was at the at the uh, comedy store, and this is back in the dark days, which you're very um, aware yeah. of, when nobody was coming. And I remember I was getting called up on stage in the OR, and right as I was get, being called up, this group of Asian kids was leaving the room, and in the <laughs> The, like right in the middle, kind of back of this seating area, there's a guy eating chicken wings um, in, in the store. He brought his own wings. He's sitting there with his boys. He brought, he's eating wings, he brought, them, brought his yeah. own food. And so he he looks at me, he goes, he sees the Asians and he sees me go up on stage. He goes, hey, your friends are leaving. And he does this as soon as he, with the wing sauce. I go, fuck. And the fuse was lit. I was like, I was like, my friends left. He goes, yeah, your friends left. I go, well, maybe I'll go outside and catch up with them. He goes, maybe you should. I go, maybe you should come outside and see them with me. He goes, maybe I will. And he takes another bite of his wing and he goes, again, I go, well, maybe we'll fucking go outside right now. He goes, let's do that. So you know how the room's set up, right? Mm -hmm. It's like that. So I get off the stage and I walk towards- Oh, you're having this conversation with him from the stage? Dude, I just got on stage. (laughs) Literally, I, I think, thought you were just about to walk up. No, you're right there. I think Jeff Scott's still playing. <laughs> He's still. Poor Jeff. So I, I walk towards the corner, uh, going towards the where the room ends, and I'm going that corner. And he walks over and he starts meet me, and I just grab him and I throw. I, I Fuck everything yeah. I have in the gro- in you know because I played hockey and I just like you're used to just that tussle first, and I I just get him on the ground. And I just start wailing on him like Ralphie in a Christmas story, beating the bully. And this guy, one of his friends, takes one of those um, the, the tables, and you know how heavy those things are. Fuck Again, yeah. comedy club furniture Talk about is not that black light. circle table. Yep. He takes it and he's gone back. Brett Ernst runs in and tackles Mr. the guy. Kai. <laughs> That's right. Of course. Mr. I would be Cobra. eating out of a straw right now if it wasn't for Brett Ernst. Man, he would have that crushed is the truth. your skull with that table. Yeah, those heavy bottom, those lead bot. Fuck, dude. Yeah, I'd, I'd have been fucked. Damn, up. Damn, man, you got into. Uh, I mean, I was asking if you've been in fights, but you've been in enough <laughs> in comedy. Yeah, I, I, but I, I, again, I think that comes with the maturity of understanding. You can never let any anybody in that room ever rankle you because you've got to be in complete control. Even if like there's a, some semblance of like insecurity that'll bubble up, the audience reads it and they will you will lose credibility you in the room will. immediately, as you as you know. And so, you know, even when when that cunt thing happened and this thing happened, it's just like you've got to be better than the situation. Any situation. So now, you know, years on there's nothing that'll rankle me, and it's almost like I'm Dean Martin on stage, where I'm a little more cooler than the situation. Just like, oh, you really think that? Okay. And then slowly you slide into the arsenal of weapons. It's like, I got a pocket knife. I got a Chinese star. I got a gun if I need it. I got all these things. We so- figured you had a Chinese yeah. star. <laughs> I got all these. Exactly. <laughs> Nowadays, I could just cough on somebody. <laughs> but um, but even... Are you okay? I'm all right. <laughs> 
By the way, he laughed so hard at his own joke, he choked himself. I choked so on if that. you choked to death, it would have been because of your own fucking joke. I laughed at the racism within the, within the, the, the yeah. joke of those people being absurd. But even yeah. the cops, when they called me, they said, Do you want to press charges? I said, No. Because even at a young age, I, I had the wherewithal to say, it's my this is my lesson to learn. I I, I could press charges, I could have sued them, I could have, but it was like I fucked up. That was on me. I shouldn't have taken it to that level, and I should have never let somebody... If I'm a professional comedian, and if I, the aim is to be a headliner, a headliner's got to be better than any situation, period. And I wasn't at that time, and having foresight, young enough to have foresight, I was just like, you, you can't do that. You're fucking You're right. Idiot. I mean, I believe in exactly what you're saying, but I there are times I daydream that someone comes up on stage and I take that mic cord and I wrap it around their motherfucking neck and I just oh, yeah. start the Nero stomping. <laughs> you know, I do have that fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> like when that guitar rack, remember he smashed it on the yeah, person and then the audience yeah. turned on me, he's like, what? The? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, he's got it right. <laughs> That's every comic's fantasy. It's, it's great. Damn, dude. I didn't know you had that kind of fucking heat coming in comedy. Yeah. Um, what did you want to go into next? You said you had a Phoenix fight story. Oh, Phoenix! Yeah, is that is, a comedy one? This is this is comedy plays into it. Okay, All right. so I was in Phoenix doing a young Mike Young had this young comedian tour. Okay, it was like Sebastian and me and Kreischer and whatever. And so we go out on the road, and I mean, we're just young and dumb. You go out, and it's just like a stumbling plethora of dudes and booze, and I had met a girl with one of the other comics. We go back to the hotel. We jump in the pool. We're all hanging out. Eventually, we partition off. I'm in a room with the girl, and you know, hang out. And then, and you know, it's time for her to go. So, so I I, I walk her down to the other comics room, and uh, and the girls are talking, and me and the other comic are talking, and eventually, uh, the girls just kind of leave and walk out. And I was like, oh, I'm going to walk into the car. He goes, Oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to stay here. I was like, Okay. So as I walk out now in the lobby, it's probably been two minutes since they left. Um, I'm walking in the <laughs> in the lobby, and they parked in the parking garage below. And I see this black guy, and this is relevant to the story, okay? So I, I would normally say just a guy, but he's a black guy. He's holding the doors open to the elevator, and there's four guys behind him. So it's like <laughs> it's like new additions there, okay? <laughs> and I crawl under, <laughs> I crawl under. Getting out. So, I go under his arm. <laughs> I go under his arm, and he's hitting on the girl. You ducked under his arm. I duck under his arm, and I'm like, "Gents, I totally get it, but uh, I'm just walking to the girls' the car, and I, I, I'm Patrick Swayze in Ghost. I do not exist. He doesn't even pay attention to me. He's like, he's like, come on, girl, let's just hang. She's like, I, I'm not hanging out with you. He's like, come on, come on, give me your number. Let's give me your number. She's like, I'm not giving you my number. He's like, you want the, you want to hang with this bling? You want to hang with this bling? He's holding up the necklace. She's like, I don't want to hang with your bling. And I'm, even his buddy's like tapping on the shoulder, like, come on, whatever, let's go. This goes on for what seems to be at least like five minutes. It's nonstop. The elevator's boop, boop, boop. And he's holding it. The boys, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, fuck. And, and then she says, He's like, come on, come on, girl, let's just hang. Give me your number, give me your number. She goes, I'm not giving you my number, you, and then she drops the end bar. No! Yeah. Oh, and she says the N-word, and now all of a sudden it's just like, oh, God, oh, God. He walks in the elevator. And there's four black guys There's four in there? black guys. Four. Five together, okay? He walks Johnny in the elevator. Johnny Gill showed up now. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny Gill just rolled up. Like, God damn it. They're all here. <laughs> Even the new, new additions here. And I'm going, boys to men, ABC, <laughs> BBD. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's got family. Oh, my so God. So the door shut. He walks in, and he starts walking towards the girl. And I get in front of him, and he grabs me, and I grab him. Again, I played hockey. I know you grab the jersey. So I grab his shirt and I pull it over his head and I'm going for broke. I'm like, we're in an elevator and I'm just wailing on him as hard as I can to just end this situation. So he drops to his knees and I'm hitting and I'm just going, I'm just drilling. I'm drilling as hard as I can. And he goes, chill, dog, chill. I go, what? He goes, chill, dog, chill. I go, you done? He goes, chill, dog, chill. I go, are you fucking done? He goes, I'm done, I'm done. Now, in this moment, I realize the elevator is stopped. We're not moving at all. Because oh. when we grabbed each other, we knocked it off its moorings. So we are stuck between the lobby and the parking garage. 
The girls are crying. I remember Sarah smiles by Hall and Oates is playing ah, in the elevator. Smile. <laughs> I want to smile a while for me. Sarah. So every time I'm in a CVS or Walgreens and I'm waiting to pan and hear that song, <laughs> shoot, I'm in an elevator in Phoenix, okay? So now this guy. Wait, so it's you, two girls, and four or five of the sisters. No, like, just the one guy. Okay, just he, the one got guy. In. he got in. He got in. They're okay. still out there, all right, okay? All right, all right. So now he gets up <laughs> and. He takes, he pulls his shirt over his head. The song's playing. The girl's crying. Nobody's talking, okay? And he's pulling his shirt over, and he's just staring at me. He's staring at me, and I go, he's going to fucking, he's going to come at me. He's going to hit me, so get ready, get ready. And he's staring at me, and I start staring back at him, and he's looking at me, and he kind of squints his eyes, and he goes, uh, hey, man, were you, uh, were you on BT's Comic View? <laughs> I go, yeah. He goes, you do the Bruce Lee bit? I go, yeah. He goes, I fucking love that joke. <laughs> I was like, fuck yes. You just kind of did that shit on me here in the yeah. elevator, man. <laughs> and so he goes, he goes, what are you doing here? I go, well, I was just at the improv where I met this fucking racist. This so, racist. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that. And so now he and I are talking. The girl's crying. And then all of a sudden I hear, Bee! and the elevator goes back to the lobby. So I guess the uh, general manager came over and did some key or whatever. The elevator doors open. His boys are waiting there. They heard everything. His boys come in, pop, pop, pop. Oh. I just get tink, 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 shirt ripped. They rip my shirt, punch me here, punch me. I got a black, I, it starts to swell up. They cut my lip. He goes, no, 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 guys, guys, guys. You know who he is? And I go, oh, he goes, remember on Comic View, he does the Bruce Lee bit? They go, oh, shit. <laughs> he goes, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, up. I'm like, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm safe. And, uh. I'm like, yeah, I'll get you guys tickets if you want to come to the show. I'm like, like, you know, doing this shit. I'm like, okay, fuck it. And then, and then the manager in the lobby goes, the manager goes, I called the cops. They're on their way. They fucking bolt. The girl's in the elevator. It goes back down. I'm standing there by myself in the lobby, shirt ripped, bleeding, eyes starting to puff up. And I'm not saying who the comic is, but you'll be able to figure this out. Literally dressed in all Adidas. Walks out of the business center with a cappuccino, holding it with two fingers, and he just looks at me and goes, what the fuck happened to you, guy? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's that's the end of that story. <laughs> that's my God greatest damn, fight dude. that I've ever been in. And look, I, I mean, how I, do you top that? Beating the guy and then he recognizes yeah. you in the middle of it. I've been on the ass end of fights, but that was my last. That was my last fight. That was my last fist fight. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, you can't be still fighting in your thirties yeah. and forties. Yeah, I mean, if you're still actively fist fighting in your forties, you're really, you really got problems. You got issues. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, no, nah, let's go fuck them up. Like, let's. Yeah, let's a drive psychiatrist away. number. Let's drive away. Away. Yeah, let's I mean, drive my away. hamstrings yeah. tight right now. You know. <laughs> yeah. I realized I was out of shape for fights when I had kids that had to start chasing them when they were toddlers and run. I'm like, oh, nah. yeah. You just wrestle with them. You're like gassed. And you know how fights go. Like it only lasts. It's it's not long. Never. It's, it's never, never long. long. It's no they yeah. live scene with Roddy Piper and Keith David. It's fucking few minutes. Everybody's out of breath. Like, <laughs> yeah. Everyone's tired. Shit. Like you done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> you know, I'm not, yeah, yeah, my, my, I uh, could take more of this beating, yeah, yeah. but my cardio can't. Yeah. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I apologize for not being up to speed for you to beat my ass. <laughs> there is oh that mutual God. respect now, I think, as you get older, if you're in bars and stuff and somebody gets slippy or whatever. I think now at our age, you see a little sprinkle of a gray in there. You're like, guys, do we? let's just get a beer. Let's just get a beer. Yeah. Let's have a drink. I've had a few of those where the situation has been diffused via another friend or whatever. It's like, let me just buy us around, guys. Let's just do that. And I think everybody knows it's like, yeah, let's just do that. Well, you come from Pittsburgh. I'm Baltimore. Towns like Philly. Like, they're, they're blue-collar, yeah, hard-working towns. And yeah. you're going to get in fights. They're angry fucking cities with yeah. chips on their shoulders. Oh, yeah. And people want Bad diets go. and... Yeah, everything. <laughs> bad diet, bad go. childhood, yeah. chips on your shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what would you like to share next? Uh, well, about um, well, I guess we could talk about uh, yeah. I, I mean, you know, comedy has provided me with so many lessons in in terms of you know how I 
handle myself in my everyday life and how you take lessons from the stage. And, you know, there was this period of time where I was, uh, I was a New York City comic and I'd go in and out and I'd, I was making money on the road, but I let go on on the road because you could spread your wings. You could do a half hour. And also being a young guy in my 20s, it was also like you're a big fish in a small pond. So you're going to like Deja Vu in Columbia, Missouri right, yeah. and those clubs where you just like, oh my God, there's all these girls here and they just saw you on stage and what a layup and let's see what happens with the night and living it up. And I was in Houston, Texas. I believe the call the club at the time was called Spellbinders. Um, and this is before it became the Houston Improv, before the Houston Improv to, moved to the new, new area. And... Uh, Again, I was working on the road, and I, I went out on the road with another comic from New York City who was headlining, and I was featuring, and it was a gorgeous space, and it was brand new, and it was like the first week the club was open, so the staff is drinking with the managers and the comics, they're tailgating after shows and stuff, and and like Thursday, I'm meeting everybody, and then Friday, I'm, uh, I'm talking to this bartender who was really pretty and really cool, and we ended up hanging out that night, and you know, getting something the next day to eat. And and then Saturday comes along and she, she, uh, we were drinking. It was, it was just like Friday. It was great. And then, um, the other comic was hanging out with a waitress and I'm with the bartender. We end up going back to the comedy condo and at the condo, we had had quite a few drinks to take us in the evening and we were fine then, you know, and we come to find out that it was this girl's birthday and none of her friends had called her. And she was really kind of upset by that. And and then she just wanted to leave. We, she wanted to leave. And we're like, you're not leaving. You're, you're, you're hammered. You, yeah. you can't go anywhere. And she's dry, crying and nobody cares and all this stuff. So the other comic and I said, look, let us go get, um, let us go get some food. So we go to the grocery store, which is like a block away. And we walk over there, we walk back. And I bought her a birthday cake. And some That's candles, nice. and and said, "Hey, let's celebrate your birthday." And that seemed to change the mood, and got some food in her. We're thinking, okay, maybe she'll be okay. She's still kind of like a little out of it and stuff. And so, I remember she wanted to leave. I hit her car keys. She found them. I hit her shoes. She found them. Um, I hit her purse. She found it. I, I was like doing everything Sounds I like could. You might suck at hiding. <laughs> Sounds more like you're like, I set them over here. I set it over here. <laughs> well, that's that's probably true. <laughs> I was not good at hiding it. Yeah. So so eventually I got to a point where I was like, I, there's only so much a human can do, right? Before you tell somebody, you shouldn't do this. And I was just like, I got to go to bed because I was gassed. I was tired. And I've been there. I, when I you're it, trying right? to reason with a drunk person, it's yeah. impossible. It's impossible. So I remember going to bed that night and I heard the other comic and the waitress talking to her. And it sounded like everything was kind of okay. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I can go to bed. So I, I just passed out, right? And I woke up the next day and the other comic woke me up. And said, we got to go to the comic club. Uh, the the manager wants to talk to us. I said, oh, okay. So we go over. Which, just so everybody knows, is not fucking it's normal. Never a good when, sign. Yeah, you're not waking yeah. up. If you're not doing morning radio, you're definitely not going to the club. Yeah. They want nothing to do with you until it's showtime, right? Um, so I go over with uh, the other comic and come to find out this girl had driven driven home that night and got into a car accident and died. Died? Died. Um, you... And what the other comic had told me was- Was the um, other girl in the car with her? No. No, she was by herself. And basically what well, happened on was- On her birthday, she died. On her birthday. Fuck. And the other comic had told me that basically what they had worked out is that she had convinced them- she wasn't going to drive home. She just wanted to get out of the condo. She wanted to be by herself. And so the deal was struck that they were going to drive her to her car and she's going to pass out and sleep in the car and then wake up and then drive herself home. So they told me that they, because the, the manager wanted to hear everything that had occurred the night before um, on behalf of the club and, you know, if, if we did anything wrong or anything like that. So, so basically... What had happened was 
uh, the other comic and the waitress drove her to her car. They saw her lay down, and it looked like she was going to fall asleep. So they got back in the car. And as they got on the road to go um, back to the condo, she gunned it past them. And they thought, oh, no, that's not a good sign, you know. Um, so we got the the horrible news the next day. And then... Did she hit anyone else or... Did... No, I don't know the exact <sighs> details. I just know that she had she passed. Died. Right? She died. She died. So then I had to perform that night and I was scheduled to be there for two weeks. So I couldn't this leave. Vegas? This is in Houston, Texas. Houston, Houston. So I was there to feature for two weeks to make enough money to make it worthwhile. And at, you know, again, I was young and, and I wish I had the wherewithal to just say I should probably leave, but I stayed there. And then it was almost like I had a scarlet letter branded on me because I had been one of the last people to see this person. And there was an enormous sense of guilt thinking and rehashing everything that occurred that evening of you know, what What else could I have done? You know, I, I, I should have just stayed up. I should have, like, forced her to... to you could have been better at hiding. I could have been too, a better right? at hiding. I could, <laughs> you could, could have, have been, been a lot better at hiding, hiding. yeah. <laughs> you know, you start thinking of all those things you sure. could have done, and then what and then, happened and was... And then in reality is there's nothing. I mean, short of holding that person down, yeah. there's nothing you can and do. And me and the other comic discussed doing it. what they want to do. But this is, the, this is where it all kind of came to a head, was where... I had to talk to her mother. Her mother wanted to know everything that happened. Oh, so her mom called man. me and I told her everything, oh. everything. I just went into detail throughout the whole, whole course of the evening. And not that I needed solace. I, I would hope that the mother would be provided solace. But the mother said, you know, once she got her mind fixated on something, you could never stop her. She was very stubborn. And that to me gave me a moment of like, you know, like, like comfort, I said, some, I some comfort and solace yeah. where I was like, uh, you know. That's nice I of that lady that, who just lost her child to be able to throw that your way. Yeah. And then before the show that night, her fr her best friend came and I had to sit down. I, I you know, I didn't have to, but I, I sat You're down. You're having to I, do this shit bef during the day. <laughs> this is your before day the show. before this is my the show. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> that is so. My day could have been dude. a lot worse. You know, it could have been. I could have could not know, have had that day. Could have been, been dead too. There's a thousand variables Jeez. that could have happened. And and I talked to a friend and 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 went into detail about everything about about that occurred once again. And you know, she was at the mi same mindset, telling me some of the similar things about the uh, from the mom. And obviously, it was it was it was really difficult to have those conversations, especially to a mother. But I will tell you that. Early on in my career, I learned the dangers of being out after midnight and that it comes with severe consequences. And I touch upon that briefly in the opening act in the film uh, with levity via another experience that really happened to me. But this one was too um, too painful and too dark. You know, there was a, a, an immense burden of guilt I, I carried Man, with myself for yeah. for years. And to this day, I still think about it, you know, oh, every now and then. How could you not? You tried to stop a person yeah. from killing themselves, and they did it anyway. I mean, that's... Yeah. Yeah, that'll fuck with anyone. And dude. so I pulled myself off the road after that. You did? I, I said, I will never go on the road. And I, 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 I went to New York City and just... I was a full-time comic in New York, and that was it. And it wasn't until years later that, you know, I moved to LA and started kind of like, I, I, I hit the road again as a headliner. Um, and I, it had been, I don't know how many years it had been since I'd been on the road uh, as a comic, but that was, that was it. That was the, the moment in my life where I was like, all right, there, there are consequences to your evenings, you know, so just Bear our, that our mind day it. job doesn't start until a lot of times eight. Sometimes you got a ten o'clock show. Yeah. You got the midnight. You got the eleven. You know, you remember the old Ontario days, seven, nine, and eleven on a oh. Saturday. You're not getting out of there till after one. Yeah. Everybody wants to go do something. You got to drive back if you're featuring or opening. You know, that's a hell of a drive. Yeah. Exactly. I remember I was dating a girl at the time in comedy, and um, she got a DUI. Mm -hmm. 
And I started to, I watched how it affected her life. It's not like you pay 10 grand and then you don't have a fucking DUI on your record. Right, right, you pay yeah. 10 grand, the shit's there. Yeah. And public transportation to the AA meetings, to the getting shit signed, yep. to, I just watched how it ate away at her time. Yeah. And I thought, well, shit, I'm here back in the day at World Cafe or mm -hmm. wherever we are. I'm having three or four beers. Sure. I know I'm fine to drive. I know I'm fine to drive. Right. But if a kid runs out, adult, anything happens, they're going to say, well, you have alcohol. That test is not designed for us to pass. Right. And I'm going to be fucked. And that was the that was like the real shift where I really – I mean, I still I smoke weed. But yeah. I, 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 if it's not a water or a Diet Coke, I, I might even have half a beer sure. at a club. But that's it for me. And also sitting down talking to guys – um, and girls that we know who are like, I can't just have one. If I put one to my lips, I'm going 20. You know, right, I wish yeah. I could drink a half a beer. So I, I started to see like how it really is, you know, a disease and addiction. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm fortunate. Yeah. So I try not to, you know, and these days with, and I know that was early on, but these days with Uber and all that shit, there's no reason you should yeah, get Yeah, it's DUI. almost like you don't have an excuse anymore yeah. to uh, put yourself in those situations. But yeah, look, I mean, it comes with being young and dumb, right? I mean... I was certainly young. I was certainly made some careless decisions. I know for a fact there are nights I've gone out and, you know, driven home when I shouldn't have. No doubt. Um, and I thank God that I look back on those days. I'm like, geez, thank God I didn't have a cell phone, you know, looking down and right. all that other crazy shit, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it, you know, you. it just seems like everybody's got a lesson to learn. And, you know, for me, my lesson came with less of an expense than, than hers did. And it, it was certainly... Certainly, it, it it stuck with me, and I, I went into uh, a, a depression. I'd say for a good year over it. I was pretty uh, pretty tore up about it. Um, and you take it out in different ways, but it 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 definitely hurt. But it definitely it definitely also helped me again recalibrate my perceptions on going out and indulging in the nightlife and not letting my ego get too big right. uh, after any show, no matter how big or how great it was or whatever. So that was pretty brutal. Yeah, that's a tough lesson to learn. Yeah, and I was I recently moved into uh, a new home, and my parents uh, from Florida had sent me a box full of old pictures and you know programs when I was performing, and I uh, I was just going through all these pictures I haven't seen since like you know fifteen twenty years or whatever, and one of the pictures was was me talking to her no. when she was behind the bar, and she you know just really, really beautiful girl, and I'm looking at her, and, and I'm making a laugh in that moment, and I was just kind of like, wow, it's, uh, it, it just kind of re-triggered yeah. everything, and uh, again, just, um, you know, it, it and is now something now being that, a parent, too, and seeing it from that perspective oh, as well, like, could yeah. you imagine? I know, bro. It would kill me, too, but I would want to talk to you, you know? I'd yeah. want to ask what she was like, you know, all that stuff, but man. Sure. And and, and, and again, I, 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 I'd known her for 72 hours if that you know and and what an what an impact that that experience that the you know that whole situation that it had on my life and how it um carried on with me so i had um an eerily i'd say somewhat similar experience yeah. uh, a friend of mine when we were living out here early on um, had come out to visit, and yeah. uh, and he brought a friend, uh, this girl with him, yeah. who was then going down to Mexico from here to like they came together, and then they were going to split up here. She was going to Mexico to surf with some friends. Okay, this beautiful young, probably twenty two, mm -hmm. twenty three, just. I can't tell you, like, you ever meet those people where they're just so pleasant and, sure. you know, they say the smile lit up the room. I'm, I'm talking about, like, just like, this girl's like a sunbeam, for right. real. So I was like, man, you're a really nice girl. You could tell well-raised, right. you know. Um, and the next day, she's driving to Mexico. So she is in a car with a, a guy mm -hmm. up front, and then there's four other people in the car behind them. They couldn't fit them all in one car. And they're driving, and they're in Mexico now, and all of a sudden, this car comes at them on the other way and veers at them, forces them off the road. Well, they go down a cliff, they roll, they crash, and it's it's bad. Yeah. And they're laying there dying. And 
these locals come out and don't help them and they rob them. Oh, they take fuck. their watches, their watch, and their four friends are watching this. And they realize after the police come, they both die. They die. No, Jesus. They Christ. realize after the police come, the police are telling them, look, sometimes this is a setup. They'll have that car could have swerved at them in order to make them crash. And then they come over and they rob you and, and they flipped and rolled and and we get the news and I'm like, that girl that was just here 12 hours ago, that really nice, sweet little girl is gone. And then her family has to go figure out how to get her body out of another country. And it's like all this shit. And you're like, fuck. And I yeah. I have never, I, I like you said, I knew that. I didn't even know that girl. She yeah. just stayed overnight with us one night. I met her 12 hours, yeah. 20 hours. I have never forgotten that girl, and I just thought, man, what a... F That's every parent's worst nightmare. You're moving sure. to California. Oh, my God. Please be careful. And she's not even there a few days, and she's gone God in a it. brutal, ugly way. So, yeah. I, I, yeah, that one haunts me, too. I think about that often. Like, God, that poor fucking girl. What? Yeah. And then to be robbed, and when they maybe they could have saved you. You know what I mean? They're taking your watches and phones and shit. Like, come on. God damn. Yeah, it's, you know, the, um, you know, I, I think as you go on with your life, it's kind of like thinking to your childhood. You think of all the times like, you know, you jumped off that cliff or you yeah. did this and you're just like, my God, I, it's a miracle I'm still alive, you know, given. It's amazing any of us make it past 17, 18, yeah. all, all the, the dumb shit, shit we young. did. Yeah, my God, no helmets, no protective gear yeah. concussion after concussion all of it you know i it's yeah you're right it's it's um well but i learned that i'm not good at hide and seek <laughs> you're, you're terrible at hiding I'm, shit, I'm, I'm bad at hiding I'm shit yeah jesus christ shit. um tell me about this reception story i want to hear about this oh the reception um well this is you know, I, I I think we all have a perception of how we view ourselves, or especially in the entertainment industry, how we may be viewed, right? And so I had a sitcom called Sullivan and Son. Can I ask you, does yep. that live anywhere on Hulu? Is there anywhere right now where you can no, still you go can, binge No, you can like buy there? it on Amazon, okay. but only the first two seasons. Like the third season, for some reason, shelved. Um, it but, never aired? Or it, oh, it aired, release? yeah. Okay. It aired, but it you just... You just can't buy that one. Yeah, it's just another show that's in the Warner vault, you yeah. know, um, great experience. One of the greatest professional experiences I've ever had I in my life. You had your own sitcom, dude. It's the dream. It was the dream. Yeah. I, I, I think especially great cast comics of our generation. Roy that was the dream. Wood and, and yeah, no doubt. And, um, uh, what's the dad's name? For Dan Loria. Dan. Yeah. Yeah. God, so good. Brian Dole Murray was, right. it was great. Um, and so the show <laughs> comes out and it was, you know, I, I know for a fact we're the second Asian American sitcom to have ever been on the air. That's it. What's and the first one? The first was Margaret Cho's All American Girl, oh, yeah. and then before yep. that, there was a pilot shot for Pat Morita. Okay, there was a pilot shot for a comic named Johnny Yoon, who was a Korean comic that was uh, that had a film called uh, They Call Me Bruce back in the yeah, day. Yeah, oh, I remember They Call Me Bruce. Yeah, yeah okay. So he had that film. Um, so it's just a handful of you know asterisks littered throughout the history of entertainment. I'm thinking, oh, this is kind of cool. You know, second Asian American sitcom. And it comes out and we get the viewership. We're doing really well, but never any attention or, you know, just, it just kind of was on for people that liked it, which is the way it should be, right? But in this day and age of diversity, nobody ever gave a shit about acknowledging like this feat that it had occurred. And I was thinking, oh, this is kind of important in you know, for the community and especially the Asian Hell community yeah. and all this stuff. And I have to say, because it's always, it seems like whenever there's someone of a certain community, whether you or Joe Coy with the Philippines or yeah. Conor McGregor with Ireland, like I feel like outside the U.S., people back their people hard. Yeah. They go hard for their shit. Right, yeah. Uh, I, I think, you know, Joe certainly... We're both mixed, right? And Joe, I, I believe, leans more into his Filipino roots. I, I'm i more of a centrist where 
a lot of my comedy too explores the identity issues that I might have and and being tribeless essentially. Uh, but I think sometimes you can stake a claim to a tribe and and be very successful as mm-hmm. as Joe has. So you know the show comes out, we're doing well, three seasons, all the stuff. I'm going in the third season, and there was an Asian American blogger and a prominent uh, Asian actor uh, there, and we're we're. They were on set, and then we go out to we go to the commissary to have lunch. And I go, I was just like, this is crazy. Like, they somebody had called me to talk to me about Fresh Off the Boat, how it's the second Asian American show to come on the air since All American Girl. And I'm like, you're asking me to compliment the show and saying they're the second. But you, I'm are. the second. Show, they're the third. Then, so so I was kind of like a little dismayed. At all the attention it was getting, but I also know it's ABC and they got they're putting all this money into it yes. and they're, they're making a thing out of it as opposed to me and Jody Long and Vivian Bang, right? So I was a little miffed by it and I brought it up to them and I said it's just kind of kind of odd that we're not getting the support from the community and and this uh, blogger had said, well, it's because you're not Asian. I was like, what? He's like, well. Asians don't look at you as Asian, so you're not Asian. So you could think that, but, and I was like, like I've been called the worst things you could ever imagine throughout the course of your life, right? Those black I mean, guys thought you were fucking Asian. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. Everybody else is Jackie yeah, Chan, the, yeah. and everybody else thought you were Asian. And that's exactly the 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 issue I had with it, right? Where I've been called the worst things by a thousand different people of all different race and creeds, and. And then finally, I'm sitting down inside Warner Brothers Studio as I'm about to walk to my sitcom that I've done for two seasons, and this is the first episode of the third, and I'm so proud of everything. And it it was like somebody had held a mirror up to me and said, you never saw that mole on you? I was like, no, I never. And all of a sudden, it just changed the way I felt about myself, about my identity. In what way? it, It hurt. You know, It really, really hurt. To hear someone prominent in the tribe uh, say that about me, and all, I, I, almost like everything I'd ever thought about myself was kind of like a misconception, and it's almost like you know, like finding out your parents or adopted you, and it's like not your real parents. It's like what? Right. Wow. So my identity was kind of like, whoa, holy shit, that's really fucking crazy. But then, well, can I ask you why do you think Asians? Or did he think Asians didn't see you as Asian? I think for the same reason, you know, Mariah Carey will get guff from, like like Whitney Houston. I saw this documentary on Whitney Houston. And when she was as successful as she was, whatever, I she was getting, like, booed at the, I, I forget what, what the awards were for the black community at the time, but, but the black community was not receptive of her. They were not receiving her. And so she went on to make more soulful albums to kind of, you know, I guess appease that that sect of the audience, but you know, I guess there's always that that notion of like you're not black enough, you're not Asian enough, you're not Mexican enough, you're not American enough, you're not Republican enough, you're not Democrat enough, right. and then I just I, you know, at that time it really did hurt and it was very confusing. But as time went on, I was like, well, nobody's gonna fucking define me. I'll be in charge there of defining myself. So fuck that. And so that was kind of like. I, I, I guess a pivotal moment in my life where I heard something so profound and I took it in a negative fashion, but I had to twist it and find the daylight in that situation and say, okay, well, again, you you know, are you going to let one person affect you because that's their opinion? It might be the opinion of many other people, but the opinion, the only opinion that matters is what I think of myself and how I view myself and how I present myself and how I can, what is the information that I'm communicating on stage that I'm parlaying to the audience that I want them to receive. And so part of that is, is now, you know, developed into this new hour where, you know, being Korean and being Irish, it's like, I don't, I truly don't have a tribe. When all this BLM shit was going down, I think that there were BLM activists reaching out Saying, "Where's all the Asians? Why aren't you supporting?" And oh, I was that seen, right? I didn't know that. <clears throat> I had seen they were here. They were right outside here. They were out here. And, and, and there's this shit. one black comic had said, "Where's all the Asians supporting BLM?" And then I went through and screen capped 
because I was on another feed seeing uh, my Korean friends, like their storefronts destroyed. So I screen capped as many as you can fit in one, you know, mosaic. And I, I tweeted back, they're a little too busy cleaning up after this mess. And, you know, I, I think like even when the BLM stuff was, everything got tribal real quick. You're either mm-hmm. white, you're black, or you're a Republican or a Democrat, whose side are you on? And in that moment, I went back to that um, conversation I had with that blogger. And I was like, my tribe is what I define it as. And my tribe is just being an American. That's truly what, and I think if more people stopped partitioning themselves and looked at ourselves equally as Americans under the banner of the flag, I think we'd all get along a lot better. But that's not what's happening. There's niche entertainment. Nothing's communal anymore. That's why award shows are not successful Mm -hmm. because there's no communal, like we all grew up with the Goonies. We all grew up with, you know, whatever the, back to the future. Nowadays, that's that. This new generation is not going to have that. There, this geek culture is going to be so partitioned and divided. I think the only communal thing really that happens these days is sports and news, and that's fucking it. Yeah, you're right. So you're we're right. as separated yeah. as as we ever will be, and I think it's going to continue to happen uh, unless perhaps people like myself push the pendulum back the other way and say we're looking at this the wrong way. We got to look at this as like we're all unified. We're all here together. It's a really you make a really great point cuz but it's a voice of the minority right now. I, I get yes. shit on constantly for for saying these things. If I post an American flag, I lose followers. People shit on me. But are they are they mostly Asian followers you're losing when you do something <laughs> like that? I'm really curious though. Do you know? I think it's across the spectrum. I post I am It is funny to me. You're right though. Like this last 4 years. Yeah. It's like if you wear an American flag shirt, you're yeah. you're a Trump supporter. Like they don't own the flag. Yeah. They don't own the Bible. They don't own guns. I mean, they own guns, but yeah. they don't own the Second Amendment. Right. You know, like that's not theirs. Like that's sure. everybody's. But you're right. It's it's like well, well most uh, whatever. Every there. You're right. There's these different sects, and it's yeah. We are so divided. I, here's what I want to know. Like, it's a great point. Like. So I can be discriminated my whole life for being Asian. But when it comes to finally being recognized as Asian, you're all going to tell me you don't see me that way. You're not. Yeah, yeah. that's a huge fuck you. What what sort of uh, racism have you – Do you rem- what's the first time you remember being treated differently or well, I, especially I remember, racist? How I was old were probably you? six. But, you know, when you're a kid, you don't know any better. But I was now, six. Now, were you bo- born in – you're always Pittsburgh, right? I was born in Freehold, New Jersey. Okay. Uh, home of uh, Springsteen, and I grew up in uh, uh, until I think I was twelve in Jersey. Uh, in Jersey, and then I moved to Pittsburgh, and that's where like my formative years really happened. So I say Pittsburgh. But is there um is there a large were there a lo- was there a large Asian community in either of the towns where you grew up? No, I don't not at think all. Pittsburgh. Like I I'm no I'm thinking back to B- Baltimore, and I'm like I don't. Fucking even, yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, that's, you know, your house is Chinatown now. It's, it's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's what that's what happens. I remember when I moved to Pittsburgh, Holly Reed was the other Asian in my, the in my other. school. Yeah. <laughs> and so the other. <laughs> at home, at the first dance I ever went to, they're like, you guys should dance together. It's like, what? Why? It's like, we're both well, you're Asian. Asian. <laughs> you guys should, you know, you'd be Asian together. Um, but yeah, I mean, I remember I was six and some kid called me a chink. And I, I I laughed. I thought that was like, oh, that's a cool nickname. And I wrote it on my baseball glove, uh, Chink. And my dad's like, my dad's like, no, he was uh, he was making fun of you. And I was like, oh, that's bad. I, I like I didn't I didn't know. And then my dad explained it to me. And I remember being six years old, looking at my mom and just staring at her like she doesn't look different to me. Like she's just my mom. I was like, is she different? And I remember going to the mirror, and I I remember doing this. I was going like this to my eyes. At six years old, and I was like, they don't feel different. And it was just like, it was weird to me. I, I didn't view myself any differently. But then as I got into junior high school, when I moved to Pittsburgh, actually, um, he ended up becoming a friend of mine. But this kid named, I don't want to say his name, but John, John uh, kept calling me a chink. Every time I walked out past him in the hallway, chink, chink, chink. I was on the bus, chink, chink, chink. And I was like, I, I was getting like angry. And my dad, I remember this is like the third day now. And I, I told my dad, this kid keeps calling me a chink every time I walk past him, every time I do something. He goes, well, what are you going to do about it? You going to let him keep saying it or are you going to do something about it? I was like, I don't know. He's like, well, it's up to you. But uh, it's, you know, you could do something about it or you could just let him keep doing it. 
And I, I was like, like it was like classic dad, right? You know, I'd have been so, like, just so you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'd be happy to sit in the office if you <laughs> punch right, him in the fucking yeah. mouth. I'll, I'll keep the car running. <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> so, <laughs> so I go in and I walk down the hall and John, I walk past him. He goes, hey, gook. Oh, I, uh, switched yeah, it. Was, it. It was uh, like a, yeah, it was like, a... And, uh, you know, I just turn around and I walk right up to him and I'll... I just fucking hit him. Fuck yeah. I hit him. And he popped back and he didn't say anything. I think he was more stunned than anything. He was just shocked. He just stood there and I, I stared at him. I thinking, okay, he's gonna he didn't do anything. And I just walked to my locker and I told my dad, I was like, Yeah, I just hit him. He goes, What do you do? I go, I go, he didn't do anything. He just stood there. He goes, he goes, that's what most of them will do. You just gotta hit him back. And most of them are scared that you even did something. I was like, oh, okay. So that was always kind of like the way of operating, not only in that moment, but I've learned early on that if, if you're going to engage, you know, just hit them first. I don't like to do this like shoving shit and you, you, you got a fucking problem. It's just like, th there's this great movie, Open Range with Kevin Costner and Robert Duvall. And something happened to one of Kevin Costner's friends. And and no, I think, it, I think it's Wyatt Earp. I, I love Kevin Costner in a Western. And it was Wyatt Earp, and he walks up to the to the gang. They're all talking shit, right? And Kevin Costner doesn't say shit. He just, he's just walking right up. He walks right up to this guy, and the guy's mouthing off to him, and he's giving him shit as he's, as he's closing in. Kevin Costner, as he's getting close, within like five yards, he goes, are you the one that shot my friend? And the guy goes, yeah, and he, and he just walks up, bang, and he just shot him right in the fucking face. I was like, I never seen that in a Western, but that's the way to operate. That's it. Someone's talking shit. So you know shit's going to go to, you just walk up, bang. Handle it. Yeah. We don't need to be chit-chatting about this yeah. bullshit. We know everything we need to know. Yeah, but that's You know so what's much. funny? I'm thinking about this over. This is where my mind's going. The word chink. Yeah. Why are we still allowed to use that when we refer to armor? Why are we allowed to chink say- the armor? Yeah. Why? Hold or on. spick and span. There's a go. I was just about to say, is yeah. there any other racial- a, a racist term that's used. Could you imagine there if you could drop an M bomb and something like that? Oh, You're like, God. oh no, 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 he meant that. Like, well, there was why? a college professor that got that lost his job because Spick when and span. I, you're right. When I was in Damn. China for the, <laughs> I didn't even true. Think of that. And other ones using it. To call. Yeah. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so I was in Beijing for the Olympics in 2008. And I was walking through Beijing, just as a normal tourist does, and I kept hearing this word over and over and over again. And it was uh, niga, 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 niga. And that is, in in uh, China, that's basically like, you know when you pick up your phone and somebody calls you like, hey, where's your keys? Um, uh, my keys are right over here. Like, that's almost like you're saying, uh, um, uh, whatever. Oh. So, so it's kind of like this, uh, like holdover until you catch right. your thought, right? So I was hearing it constantly. And I understood how much a part of the culture, it, it's just language, right? And this college professor in California lost his job because he was, he was defining the word for a class. And I think that's to the extent that things are, especially in such a progressive state as California, where yeah. you can't even define a word that could be offensive to somebody where you're just, you're not, you're taking out of context. Yeah, I'm educating you. Exactly, Yeah. yeah. And I think that's that's a dangerous slope. <laughs> well <laughs> played. <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> but it is crazy, right, to think that you can't say certain words. And look, I think it is as much as I, you know, you see the violence and everything that happened at the Capitol building unfold, and I as an American don't agree with that. I don't agree with yeah, rioting no. at the Capitol building. I don't agree with rioting in the streets and small businesses and all that other stuff. Um, but I do think it is destructive when you tell a sect of the population you're allowed to communicate your thoughts and um, opinions, but you are not. And for you know, uh, big tech companies to come in and you know, like. Twitter says you can't say this stuff on our platform. Another platform is developed for people that want to have that opinion and voice, um, and then and then big tech companies come in and say, "Oh, you left Twitter, you can." But now we're going to shut that down now too. It's just like I think that's a dangerous area, and I think any stand-up comedian, whether you disagree or agree with 
with what is being said, I think you should still agree with the fact that everybody in this country has the right to express their opinion, um, especially in comedy. And I understand people say words hurt, but Paul McCartney is never going to tell Insane Class Posse that's not music. No. Like, we should all be able to still be able to, you know, there's an audience for everybody. Do you remember when growing up, I mean, how old are you now? 46. Okay, I've got one year on you. Yeah. It was sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me or words will never hurt. I mean, that was what you, it was like a nursery rhyme that you just put in your kids. Like, it's words, it's names. Like, you know, I get racism is, we're being, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. If, you know, like your dad said, is that, well, He's going to keep saying it until you, you fucking do, yeah. make sure he doesn't say it anymore. Yeah. I remember and then you end up being was, friends with the kid. And I, I ended up being friends with him and his family. I'd go over and have dinner with them and stuff. I remember one time I was on a swing. Did you ever tell them? No, no, no. Did your dad ever bust his balls when he came over? No, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. I would have. Yeah. I <laughs> you my, you're my son's racist friend? Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> No, my, my dad was cool. My dad, I mean, he is cool. He, he he told me, I remember one time I was trying to swing at the playground and the kids were making fun of me, you can't swing. And I told my dad, I'm like, yeah, they make fun of me, I can't swing. He's like, well, can you? I was like, no. He's like, well, then there you go. And that was it. I was like, oh, I got to work harder swinging. Yeah. It's like he wasn't there to coddle me or anything like that. So yeah, he's definitely a, you know an older generation, which I, I respect. Well, I ask, we've talked about a lot. I ask yeah. all my first time guests advice they would give to their 16 year old self. So, looking back through some of the things we've talked yeah. uh, about today, what advice would you give to 16 year old you? Oh, fuck. It's so funny because this, this was actually sent to me by a woman that did an article um, on me uh, in high school. Oh, yeah. So, if you want to hold that up to one of your cameras, that's me. My senior class picture. <laughs> I don't know where. Look at eight. Is it you a 17 or 18 here? I'm 17 right there. <laughs> and do you know how bad this picture was? You don't look anything like Jackie Chan, bro. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many zits in the actual picture. My parents didn't order my senior class picture. <laughs> Is that right? Because it was so bad. They didn't want it. They didn't want it. <laughs> They they didn't they didn't they never ordered it. So you go into like your your parents' house. And there's always the picture above the fireplace. Yeah, and I have mine because there were so many zits on my face. It was so embarrassing. Oh, um, too much. But if I was to tell a seventeen year old 16. 16, 16 year old Steve Byrne anything, it'd be like, hang tight. You still have two years until your first kiss. Was it eighteen? I was eighteen. Yeah, I graduated high school until I had my first kiss. But um. I would tell myself all the things you're getting made fun of when you're 16, 15, 14, everything you've experienced, that will end up being your superpower when you get older. Yeah, you know? that's, that's great. All those things that, that, that you don't even accept right now, you're going to embrace those things in your 20. Those are the things that are going to make you different, and those are the things that, that are going to make you special. It's not a tattoo. It's everything in here, and it's all that shit that you got made fun of. It's going to make you a better person. So I think that's probably what I tell myself. Dude, that's great. That is really yeah. great. I haven't, I haven't heard that one yet. Yeah, because I'm not a fucking hack like You're all not. these other ones we had on this fucking show. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to get yeah. here, bro. <laughs> um, one more time again, promote everything, please. Uh, the city of Pittsburgh. It's uh, the Steelers. It's the city of champions. Um, not this year. <laughs> <laughs> no, not this year. Not this year. But much respect to the Ravens because you, you brought a bona fide fucking rivalry back to the Steelers. That is true. And it we is, have a great rivalry. It makes it's the it best rivalry in sports. In sports. People like, rah, 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 rah. I, I know Packers, Bears, whatever. That Those are historic. The yeah. best rivalry statistically are our two teams every time we match up. Yeah. Every to, time. To violence. Cheers. To violence on the field. North violence. Yeah. <laughs> Makes me miss drinking. Yeah. Wish I could have some whiskey right now at, at like the comedy store patio or something with, with everybody. You have a joint outside with me. Yeah. <laughs> no, <Nah, laughs> I don't I don't smoke. I'm, whiskey's my thing, but but I, I, I think I'd be remiss if if on behalf of both of us we didn't we didn't say we miss uh, our good friend Jeff Scott. Yeah, I can't even that was it just feels like twenty twenty is continuing. It doesn't feel like it's ended. Yeah, it's it not, just feels yeah. like it just carried right over and that was 
Yeah, I, I was texting with uh, Emily, and and I know Brian Scalero. I was talking with him. Mm-hmm. He just had him on. I was watching that, and yeah, seemed totally healthy. Uh, I mean, just and a Cleveland boy. Yeah, and he'd be somebody that I would uh, I would love to sit and talk with before and after my sets while he got high, and then half the time I'm on stage doing my fucking set. I'm wondering if Jeff Scott is going to come back and yeah. play me <laughs> off. This is going to be a 20 minute set, and then Eliza's going to be pissed at me because I ran the lights. Like, yeah, fuck, he's can I? Don't fucking yell at me. <laughs> talk to Jeff Scott. Well, thank you, brother. Thank you thank for you, coming on. Uh, Ryan Sickler on all social media, ryansickler.com. And as always, we'll talk to you all next week.